Got session number three, Hard Day's Night on ministry pressure, burnout, frustration. Uh, we're going to talk to the guy who wrote the book, uh, Leading on Empty. It's great. I, I would love to hear a story in a moment. I was shocked when I heard that, that you kind of got burned out. I was like, I mean... In Hawaii? In Hawaii? He gets burned out in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, That's where you go when yeah. you get burned out. Yeah. Where did he go? Yeah, I, I, I mean... <laughs> My emotional spectrum is angry to really angry, you know, so I get burned out. You you eat a lot of pizza. Wayne, <laughs> you know, we could have a break. Right. We could break. But yeah. Pastor, I heard Pastor Wayne had a break. Now, you, you eat vitamins. You drink purified water. You read through the whole Bible every year. Even when I called him for this event, he said, well, I may do it. First, I need to pray and fast about it. And I thought, no. He's either, I'm going to come or send write my that robot. Down. That's a great idea, pray and fast. How did you get burned out? I mean, you're, you're happy, pleasant. You're even charismatic. I mean, you, you, we, you we, sing. You sing publicly. I we mean, don't have it together. No. You do. What happened? <laughs> Well, this is a zoo we're here, here and now. Uh, <laughs> but you know, you, even, even though it's funny that you say, how can you be burned out in Hawaii? That's a great uh, question because actually it doesn't matter if you're in a small church, big church, slower church, medium. Uh, it's every single one of us susceptible to being burned out. <laughs> and I went through that and it just nailed me. I didn't know what was happening. What was, uh, how did it happen? What was the moment? I mean. Did it, was it gradual? No. Was it all of a sudden it just hit you? Well, you catch some things along the way. You know, you thought, you think, mm, I'm a little anxious about this. And some warnings. Yeah, and, and this decision used to be easy for me. Uh, why is he coming up with another problem? I'm sick and tired of people's problems. That's a warning sign? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're not safe in the same <laughs> session, man. <laughs> oh. Well, actually, actually, I was running before a conference. I was just jogging, and uh, all of a sudden, I found myself on the curb crying uncontrollably. And I thought, and I remember pulling up my hands like this, and I was shaking, and I thought, what in the world is going on? And I actually said it out loud. I said, what's happening? And I, all I knew was something had broken on the inside, and I just I couldn't go on. I went up to my room, I sat there, but here's the thing, when you're in ministry, you can't stop the train. It's still going. I had to speak in 45 minutes. So you put on a mask and you just grit your teeth and you dig deep and ask you know, for some kind of help. Adrenaline starts to run and you make it through. The problem is that which fuels you on the inside will also destroy you. Uh -huh. And so I began to run on adrenaline because you can't stop. You know, a pastor's life is bookended with sermons. Every weekend you've got something you can't stop. And I didn't know what to do. So I kept grinding it out and I started having anxiety attacks. What, what does that look like? Well, you have, you can't clear your breath, you know, your, your Feels lungs. Feels like you're having a heart attack? Yeah, or? it's like you can't breathe. You got heaviness. Yep. You were a jogger. How many miles a day were you jogging? Oh, not that far. 20, 30. Yeah, better than James and I. Unless there's a dog or a fire, oh, we're not yeah. running. You yeah, know? you're not running anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but you can be, <laughs> you can be healthy uh, or, or otherwise. It's really an emotional thing on the inside. Your, your serotonin levels, which is your, you know, the endorphins that are in you, just get depleted because you need to take a rest. And, and I was violating that. So it's, if you don't take a sabbatical, you get a forced sabbatical? Yeah. He, here's what... Uh, and it may sound funny to some people, but my priorities switched. It used to be God and then my spouse, my family and my ministry. 
Here's what I found, for me anyway, it's God, self, spouse, family, ministry. Because you see, if I tell people, work on yourself harder than you work on your ministry. Mm -hmm. Because if you're doing well, and you're in the word, and you're healthy vertically, then everybody around you are, they're automatic beneficiaries. Well, you work with Bill Hybels a lot, I know, and he says that 50% of leadership is self-management. 50% of the energy goes, just comment on that a little more from your experience. Yeah, because see, as a Christian, you think, I've got to put myself last, and I kept doing that. And other people, you're always going to have a wedding or a counseling appointment or something that's going to pop up. Even if you have zero appointments in a day, you're busy. So I knew that if I didn't start working on myself, I would just deplete, and I did again and again. Here's what my problem was. I thought my capability was equal to my calling. Wrong. My capacity was equal to my commission. Wrong. Because I thought if I have the capability or capacity to do that, to help somebody, I should. Isn't that what a shepherd should do? Well, it's not always. God might say, this is what I've called you to do. This is what I've asked you to do. But I thought, but I can do this. And so a lot of people might sin on the bottom side where they don't obey. I sin on the top side where God didn't ask me to do that. Although it's religious and spiritual, I shouldn't have done that. And I depleted myself. My problem is I sin on the top side. Pharisees did that, didn't they? They saw a law and they went way beyond it to show them how righteous they were. I sin on the top side. I didn't realize that the devil doesn't care what side of the boat you go off. Yeah. just so long as you go off so he knew that he couldn't tempt me on this side he could on this side mm. so he said Wayne your capability is this why not but in the end God's not going to hold me accountable for what I've done he's going to hold <coughs> me accountable for how much I did of what he asked me to do <coughs> how much of that have I done mm. now talk about that because a lot of times leaders in any organization but you know specifically for our conversation pastors you have your calling and then you have your compulsion. And, and there's a difference between your calling and your compulsion. And, and part of it too is not just managing your time, but your energy so that you can fulfill your calling and not waste your energy on your compulsions. For leaders that are hearing this and they say, okay, categorically I understand that. What does that look like to be aware of it? And what does it look like to make the changes organizationally and with family to carve out that space to be healthy? Yeah, that's so tough. Because I feel like Schindler, you know. Uh, I could have saved one more marriage. Right. I could have led one more person to Christ. And I, I just don't get any rest up here. Well, and one more in the short term. One more marriage today, but maybe not my own tomorrow. Yeah. One more marriage today, but maybe out of the ministry in five years. That's not a great plan either, is it? Because there's always going to be needs everywhere. But I have to find out what God's asked me to do and be real careful on this side. I'm just learning that. And that whole burnout thing took five years of my life. Okay, explain that. Well, you, you get nailed and, and uh, at first you think you're Superman. You think you're invincible because you link four or five successes together. You think you're bulletproof mm -hmm. at that point. And what happens is you, we don't forget that we're pastors. We forget that we're human. Thank you. And you don't understand your humanity here. So you put on a Superman suit and you don't ever take it off. You sleep with it. Right. And then you, you can't be human anymore well, because part of it is when you're leading on empty, as a book says, uh, one of the things that concerned me was the people need a hero. They need to look up to somebody that's following Christ, not a Marvel comics strip or, or something else. They, they really need an authentic, godly hero. But then you think, I'm hurting, and that wouldn't be a hero, would it? Right. And so you die to yourself, because it sounds religious, and you just start to fry. So then the road to what you perceive as success and the road to a mental breakdown become one and the same road. It's inevitable. Mm -hmm. Really. Well, that's I mean, what we were talking about over dinner last night. Bishop Jakes was talking about feeling trapped. Right. Uh, that sometimes a leader can feel like everything requires me and I need to continue. And we all have felt that to some capacity and degree. And the more responsibility, the more pressure there is to push it, 
Um, and to, and to, to even jeopardize your well-being. Oh yeah, after a while the ministry basically runs you, you start to feel trapped. One of the other symptoms is your joy starts to diminish. Mm -hmm. I still preach, but the joy of it is gone. I still minister, but the joy of it is gone. Remember Psalm 51, it says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me uh, with a rightful spirit. But, but it's interesting, it, right there, sustain me, I mean, uh, restore unto me the joy. The devil can't steal my marriage. He doesn't have authority to do that. So he steals the joy out of being married and I give up on it myself. Mm -hmm. he, he cannot steal my ministry. So he'll steal the joy of ministering and I drop out myself. Right. See, he can't do it, so he gets you to the edge. He can't push you over, but he can figure a way Make to get you, you jump. to jump. All right. And so when depression hit me, and I was wrestling with depression, I, the only way I thought, now this sounds really uh, morbid, but there were times that went through my mind that I thought the only way I can get out of ministry is die. Well, I've seen other guys I, that have actually stepped on a moral landmine. Yep. It was like, why did he do that? Well, because he wanted to blow himself up. So that, yeah, so that, so that they wouldn't give him a break, yep. but they would never bring him back. Right. Yeah. The only way to go is to go down. And we were, we were talking about that at length last night, of feeling trapped, feeling like you're a prisoner of your own fruitfulness, like I just tried to work hard and do my best, and now I've got to do this for the rest of my life, or I'm just trapped here. There's no other way out. When I was in this depressive state, uh, the only thing I could think about was, when can I retire? Do I have enough? I felt like David counting the number of his troops, you know, <laughs> in the census, and, and God was saying, don't do that. But I was saying, thinking, how much money do I have? Can I retire? Yeah. I just, I just need to, just want to out. I, yeah, I want out. Mm -hmm. And it, that took me into a deep, deep depression. And I'm out of it now. I tell people I'm, I'm sort of out of the forest, but I can still feel the bark of the trees against my back. Yeah. Just that far. What did that do to your wife? My wife is fabulous. Uh, you know, one of the things about going through burnout is you don't publicize it. It goes deeper and deeper, and because you've got to keep an exterior, and even in, at home, you you just can't vent on everybody. So when Jesus went to Gethsemane, and, and it says he he sweat like drops of blood, I understood his humanity at that point, yeah. and I thought that's what I feel like. Right. I feel like bleeding through my pores. Well, you know, I I uh, went through really two periods of time where I felt like I was going to quit the ministry. And I'm sure it'll surprise some people to hear me say that. It wouldn't surprise my wife. Uh, the first time was in 1998, and we were 10 years into our church, and we'd seen a lot happen, built a building, got into it. It's growing. It's full at multiple services. And the church graciously extended us a, an extended time away, thinking, well, we'll, go, we'll give him a break. He'll come back fired up. I, I was going to figure out a new plan. And, and uh, in the first time, the Lord, uh, much like what you described, gave me a, really some spiritual insights. I really feel like I hadn't, I'd neglected my soul. I'd neglected my walk with the Lord. I didn't understand some of the principles of an exchanged life and Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that, that I don't have to live the Christian life in my own strength, that it's God living it through me, and really was able uh, to dial up my relationship with Lord and some of the spiritual solutions to get a better resource to continue. But then I came back and went back at it just as hard in yes, that sir. strength. And I got to a different place really in about 2009 where there's no spiritual way out of this hallway. This is not a, my, my relationship with the Lord is not bad. I love the Lord. I'm not neglecting the word. I'm not neglecting my walk. A lot of times like have another quiet time, bro. Well, this wasn't going to get fixed with a quiet time or, or a faith or a prayer. And, and I had to come to see that my way of relating to my church, to my elders, was just, it was unhealthy. I was an unhealthy person. We did a big analysis of our church, and one of the feedbacks that came back was, was that I tended to bear the weight of everyone else's failed performance. You know, that's going down. Put it on my shoulders. Uh, you're upset about something? Here, let me suck all that up. I'll absorb the whole thing so we can get back on the same page again. And, and absorbing people's dysfunction, just soak it all up. Put it on me. And, and I had to come to the place where I looked at our leadership team, and I remember a particular elders meeting where I was like, this is not healthy for me. This is not healthy for me. We have to tear this whole way of relating down. And I, th I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without some good men who got over their own egos and got around me and said, we're going to make this healthy. 
and we had to just do church, do leadership, do um, distribution of responsibility in a lot different way. And I had to make myself really accountable to a team of people. No, you're not going there. No, no, we're not. You're not going to speak there. You're not doing that. I wasn't smart enough to figure it out by myself. I really had to get on a program and. Uh, but uh, two very different. Now, when you describe your situation, which of one of those was it more? Well, let me go back, ratchet back to what you just said. You couldn't do it on your own. You weren't smart enough. I tell you, when you're going through this, you have to ask for help. Yeah. You've got to get help from outside of you, someone that's objective. There's an old saying that says, the eye cannot see the eye. Now, you can't see your own eyeball. You can see through it. But if there's something wrong with it, you better have someone else help you. Mm -hmm. And that's how it is when you start to feel the decrease of joy and, and your levels start to drop and everything seems like another problem to be solved. So you I need, need more help. than a mirror to start looking. Yeah. I, can't, I can't figure that out. You've got to have someone help. And, and that's where pride has to be dashed and your ego has to be depleted in order to do that. Humility is huge. But here's what God does. It's like when you're, I'm flying at an airplane 32,000 feet. We're having fun. We're partying. We're not thinking about God. But all of a sudden, an engine sputters and another sputters. And you start doing this. All of a sudden, every passenger on that plane gets very open to God. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. And now the belly of the Give fuselage. Give me that old-time religion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then the fuselage's belly is scraping the top of the trees. And everyone's making commitments to Jesus Christ. And let's say the uh, pilot pulls it up. And now when you're back at 32,000 feet, this is what God said. Wayne, you know what I taught you down here? Don't forget it up here. And the reason I allowed this plane to go down and scrape the top of the trees is because what I wanted to teach you here, I couldn't teach you up here. What does it look like when the plane crashes? <laughs> well, thank God it hasn't. For you. For me. But you've uh, seen it happen. If it crashes, it's mostly because people bail out. I, I, st I tell people this, you know, I wish Jesus would take me by the hand and lift me over the valleys, uh, lift me over the, the trenches. But what I found is Jesus takes a hold of your hand and he drags you right through them. Mm -hmm. And you bump over the rocks and the crags, he drags you right through them. But here's the thing, he will never let go of your hand. Mm -hmm but you can let go of his. And if people crash somewhere along the line, we've let go of his hand. He won't let go of ours mm -hmm. because he's going to bring us through. And when my heels and uh, my bruises heal and my cuts uh, get sutured up, I'm able to turn around like Jesus said to Simon, when you've turned, strengthen your brothers, yeah. then I can help those coming behind me. If he just put me over like this, I would not have a bit of empathy for those that are going through this stuff. Well said. It's a great transition point. I'm gonna take it to the bullpen at this point and just get any feedback from the men. Um, Bishop Jakes, I, I would love it if you would go first um, <laughs> because there are, there is, uh, there's not a man in the room or, or a woman that's listening in that has the amount of people and pressures and responsibilities that you do, quite frankly. I mean, everybody, carries a weight, your weight is exceedingly uh, heavy. And so if, if you would be willing to add any of your thoughts, we'd appreciate you know, it. First of all, I'm, I'm just, I'm awed by, the, by uh, how eloquently this, this whole issue is addressed. Uh, I think it is of paramount importance. I deeply relate to it. And I, think, I really see it as a continuation of the conversation we had last night, right. where a unique moment of transparency existed amongst men from completely different walks of lives. Sometimes we focus so much on who we are and what we have and what we think and what we believe that we lose sight that we are brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, last night we, we found that we were all very similar in, in ways that are very, very important in terms of dealing with stress and pressure and having those moments where the plane <laughs> almost crashes. Uh, I, I think that the problem exists because many times we are so busy taking the oxygen mask and putting it on the passenger that we don't put it on ourselves and feel guilty if we do. But if you don't take heed unto yourself and then the flock of God, after a while you begin to implode. And the tragedy is, it is, it is the silent scream. In the illustration uh, that, that you just made, if the plane were going down, the passengers would scream. 
But when the leader goes down, he never says a word. That's a fact. It is the silent screaming of a tormented soul who is so affixed on a hero complex that we do not have the luxury of role reversal to get to be the recipient. We are so busy being Superman, we can never think of ourselves in terms of Lois Lane. So, so we, we, we are or not Clark equipped. Kent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Clark yeah, Kent. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, 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 what I'm saying, you, you, uh, barring the gender issue, <laughs> what I am saying is that we have not been taught to scream. We are not given permission to scream. And so whatever we go through, mentally, emotionally, maritally, uh, we, we swallow it until eventually we go under. And then when we go under, then all the sharks come out to, to eat the new victim. They smell blood in the water, mm. and the whole church comes around to watch the lynching of, a, of, of what could have been a very good person, but through this level of stress, stepped on a, a minefield and blew up. And, and I think we're seeing it happening more and more and more because our world is getting faster and faster and faster. It used to be you had a calendar for a year, but, but with the technology and everything moving the way it is now, you can't move ahead planning a year's calendar. Things are changing every 30 days, and so you have to be back in there fixing and mending. The pressure is mounting, and I just applaud in, in this forum to have this kind of conversation. I think it's very important. Thanks. That's good. Uh, Pastor Stephen, um, I'm going to address this question to you. In light of uh, the Internet, technology, um, additional pressures, stresses, responsibilities, and expenses that come to a leader and how that factors into their wellness, their joy, their sustainability. Yeah, my, my wife the other day, my wife Holly was like, you know, get off Twitter. I was fussing about something and, and I was like, I want to, but it's, it's so much good stuff that I hate to leave behind. We had, we had so many people putting on the hashtag for the event that we were doing the way God was changing their lives, and that was feeding me because I was tired and depleted. So that would fill me up, and then the one negative thing would punch a hole, and everything that had just filled me up would start leaking out. And then I find myself getting into an approval trap really quickly, and I think it's unhealthy for me. I would say that I'm personally in an unhealthy place and very blessed to be listening to this conversation in terms of how much interaction that I'm having with the opinions of people and uh, in an effort to really get out there and say some good things and encourage people, it opens up and exposes vulnerabilities. Then I'm angry at one person and uh, you start ministering out of that. So, you know, I'm thankful that the Lord's letting me get some of this wisdom from you guys today, take some notes and everything like that. I probably need to drop a registration fee on the way out because this is so helpful for me. And it's amazing. You, you can come in for half price, it's yeah. all good. It's, it's amazing to me, he'll steal your joy and get you to give up on it yourself because he can't, he can't kick you out. That really ministered to me and I'm just right. praying that the Lord will help me figure out some ways to keep the joy in it. It's what a lot of my mentors have been telling me lately. Man, you're in a great season of ministry and blessing. Yeah. Good. Don't let don't let the devil take your joy, your moment. Don't do the ministry, but miss the moment. I think is the way you said to enjoy what the Lord's doing. So I'm really listening to this. And another thing, Steve. You know, one of the things that helped me so much is every single one of us has to give somebody permission to speak into your life. If you can't name a person, I have given permission to these three men to speak into my life. If you get them. Well, and I used to think if I could comment and add on that, I mean, Howard Hendricks used to say that everybody needs somebody who can look them in the face and say, you're neglecting your wife. Yeah. However, I have found that even giving the permission uh, doesn't always produce the courage, and there needs to be some kind of continual empowering of people and reminding uh, them in our positions that, look, you're really hurting all of us and you're disappointing all of us if you don't do this. I promise. I mean, just really have to keep assuring people that everything's going to be good no matter what you tell me, and I need to hear it. Because like you said, we can't fix our own eye. So. Mm -hmm. the, the, the other thing that I, can I just Please. Yeah. for a minute? I think that, there, there, it's very difficult. Very few men of God create a platform, even if you do have a person of total transparency where you are armed with the language. Because the truth of the matter, if I were neglecting my wife, my best friend wouldn't know it. And save you are walking around in my house, 
you, you wouldn't know that the joy of my marriage is gone because we are always so camera ready uh, that we, we never appear before people fighting. You know, we're going to smile even if we get back in the, in the car. And, and maybe it's not always about fighting. Maybe it's just the depletion of joy. And, and so at the end of the day, I think what has to happen is in addition to having someone with whom you can be transparent, we have to practice on telling the truth. We who herald the truth. Yeah, well said. Do not often tell the truth beyond the truth we herald and sometimes hide behind the truth we herald because it is a safe place. Yeah. It is the word of God. It doesn't change. It's absolute. It's easy to preach about Jeremiah and, and Jacob and John because it avoids you from seeing me. And it's kind of like the, the wizard in the Wizard of Oz. You know, the little guy behind there pulling all those buttons is a little tiny guy, but nobody saw it because the boom, bada, bang, bada, all that's going on up front. But behind it all, when you, when you, cr when you crash, you don't crash outwardly, you crash inwardly. And so I think get just us broaching this subject today makes every pastor, every leader, every Sunday school leader, every CEO, no matter who it is, say, do I have a person, do, have I set aside a place and a time, and do I have the language to come out from behind the curtain and show you who I really am? Because you cannot critique what you cannot see. Mm -hmm. Well, helpful. That's so hard because you don't know if you can trust people that deeply. That's where we need to go with this. Yeah, that's, that's really hard because if you get one betrayal or one person bilking you, you, it's like a cat that sits on a hot stove. Not only will a cat never sit on a hot stove, it won't sit on any stove. Well, don't you think, Pastor, that sometimes when we limit our associations to other pastors uh, and all of our associates are doing what we do, it's kind of difficult to critique yourselves when we're, you're all doing the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, I like to have a plethora of relationships that do not compete with me, but complete me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you have to broaden your, your scope, and you, in so doing, you broaden your thinking, and, and you get to have a sounding board with somebody who doesn't echo your truth. Mm. Because everything you say is right uh, when you're in the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, um, I'm going to transition to a few questions to stay true to the format. Um, the first one, what's the most helpful thing a wife can do to prevent her husband's burnout? And Jack, I'm going to give this one to you. How long have you been in ministry now? 40 years. 40 years. How long have you been married for? 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> that was a big year for you. <laughs> 1970, Are you married? baby. Yeah. Married to the ministry? <laughs> Do you have a wife? And I'm still married to my wife also. Okay. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So this wife, apparently a wife, has a question. If she, you know, she loves her husband and she wants to help him as a friend, how can she do that? Allowing him uh, to be himself at home. Uh, you know, Deb has been great in that through these years, she has never, she's never let me get away with trying to be something that I'm not. And so I think honesty and transparency with your wife is, is critical. Uh, you talk about accountability, th this, uh, I mean, your wife should be your number one accountability problem. Now you have to be careful. Accountability problem? No, no not accountability person. problem, person, I person. should say. Okay, I misunderstood. Yeah, I get too. Yeah. <laughs> but that can be a problem is where I was headed. <laughs> That can be a problem is where I was heading because our wives, we talked about this last night, are not really equipped to, to handle all the pressure right. of ministry. And so bringing that home and dumping that at the house constantly, uh, that's what can create um, offense in the marriage and, and, and the wife ready to give up before the husband is. So Deb has been fantastic all these years in, in just the poor, keeping it real at the house and keeping keeping our kids real at the house. Uh, our, all our kids are walking in truth. They love the Lord. They, they know. I, I think what happens with, with, with ministers' homes is that the kids and the wife see somebody different at home than they see at church. And uh, we know it's true. Who is this guy that's in the pulpit uh, as compared to this guy who is at the house? And uh, you, you want your kids to later on to say, Dad was the same guy. Uh, good, bad, and indifferent. He, he wasn't somebody different at home. 
Uh, but the burnout thing is very real. And I, you know, I was just thinking as we've been talking here that uh, there's, this is a God moment for a lot of people that are watching. And it's a liberating time because I know when I went through a burnout uh, period in my life, just a total depletion, adrenaline wipeout uh, driven by prostate cancer, which I'm now healed of, thank God. But it, when I went through that, I thought I was the only one that ever did that. I thought I was so I was weak and some, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with my faith? Why can't I get over this? When you are in a burned out condition, depleted adrenaline uh, uh, depletion, you don't want to get out of bed. You don't. You dread the day. That's that was the sign for me. I always, you know, get up. Not necessarily all great till I had some coffee, but always looking forward to my day. When you are in a burned out condition, you don't look forward to anything. You are just kind trying to get through. Yeah. And so there goes the ministry. There goes the joy. And you're crawling into the pulpit. You're crawling out. And uh, I know when I went through that, Deb was so great just to nurture me, love me. Uh, care for me in that way, but at the same time, uh, you know, say you need to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually, well, you talk about humbling. Is me the pastor go talk to somebody about what I'm going through? It was a hard thing. It was one of the best things I ever did. So that's why I say it's a God moment for anybody who's listening to this and and you're feeling some of these symptoms. Don't be so proud that you can't get the help that you need. Amen. And you know, if you think about it too, uh, there's some pretty notable figures in the Bible that went through that. You think about Elijah in 1 Kings 19 after the prophets of Baal and Asheroth, that war, he runs from Jezebel and he's just depleted. And he says, I want to die. Moses probably in Numbers 20. Uh, Jonah. He was tired of the complaining of the people. Yeah. And instead of speaking to the rock, he just starts beating on it. You know, we get tired. I want to beat on some people, and uh, I just, but you can't. So you have to shove it inside, and you beat on yourself. Correct. Jonah was the same way. Jeremiah. There's a lot of notable yeah, figures. Majority of the Psalms are laments. I know for me, one thing um, I brought out my adrenal glands some years ago, and I told Grace uh, that I needed her to be my friend, and um, and I told her stop asking me what I'm doing and start asking me how I'm doing. Because I'd come home, she'd say, okay, what are you doing? Then I'd start talking about the day. Well, next thing I know, it's late at night. We're laying in bed talking about what I'm frustrated about instead of sleeping or praying or, you know, whatever. And, um, and so I, I just told her, you know, don't ask me what I'm doing. Ask me how I'm doing. And that changed the direction of the conversation when I'd get home during the day. Um, and I'll go to one more question. How often should a pastor take a sabbatical? Uh, Crawford, how long have you been in ministry? Uh, over 40 years. Over 40 years. Yeah. So, I mean, you've seen a lot of people not make it. Yeah. You've seen some crash and get yes. back up. Yeah. Um, workload, schedule, sabbatical. What's a healthy rhythm for a leader? Well, it, it varies, and it's, there's not an easy answer for that. Um, you know, I want to answer another question that's related to that, though. Okay. I, I, I think, as I listen to you, Wayne, I, I feel as if uh, some of us, uh, who mentor younger leaders are partly complicit in this whole trajectory. Sure. And I think one of the big problems is that everybody parades around going to conferences that focus on, focuses on leadership development or how to be more strategic, where we really ought to spend a lot more time talking about leader development. Uh, and we also need to hold up the whole principle of brokenness and God dependence from the very beginning and develop our, our rhythms around our, our forever need for the Lord and keep a little bit more of a distance between what I'm doing and who I am. And I think it's a way of thinking that we need to constantly press into. That's been my salvation. Okay, unpack that. Your, your identity is not your ministry. Your identity is not your ministry. That sounds like a cliche and it can be, but you know, there needs to be a profound simplicity in terms of how we approach these things. And I think, James, you describing the second time around is that's where you came back to. You came back to the realization that, look, God hasn't been using me because I know how to plan, lead, organize, and control. God's been hitting a straight lick with a crooked stick for years. Right. <laughs> for years he's been doing that. And so we've got to stop looking at ourselves in the mirror and singing how great thou art or, 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 <laughs> you know. We, You've been we, saving that one, haven't you, Crawford? No. I mean. I, 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 you know, I'm, really, I'm really serious about that. And I think we've done these younger leaders a, 
a hellacious disservice because what they see, what they see is the grace of God that's used uh, crack chip clay pots and they want to hear the principles as to how, how you can get all these multi-sites and folks coming in, this kind of thing. And so they get on this treadmill of performance when the truth of the matter is God just breathed on us. So you're saying teaching on how to get used instead of teaching on That's how to right. be healthy. That's right. And not to, not to run a cliche in the ground, but, you know, I, I was really moved last night. I wish all of, all of this whole group could have been there. That was a God moment as we sat around talking at dinner and, you know, and Bishop shared some things as to where, where he's at. And I, I had this moment which I, I had tears in my eyes. I wish that every, every young leader, every dude 35 and younger could have been in that room last right. night. To, to hear uh, Wayne gets to this place now in his life, but I think, okay, how, how do we help this generation distance their gifts? See, gifts are oversold. Gifts are not a statement about my value to God or anybody else. It's just something that he uses. It's something that he is. It's like Moses' staff. I mean, it's just any old thing. God doesn't use what we bring to the table. He uses what we surrender to him. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's in that personal, deep relationship with God. And stop bifurcating that and stop, stop separating that from what you do and lead with that. And I think that's where the energy comes. And that's when the Holy Spirit speaks to your hearts to know how much I need to push this day, when do I need to pull back tomorrow, and you learn to listen to that. At this point, I'm uh, supposed to wrap things up, but I, I feel compelled in the Holy Spirit instead um, to just ask you, Pastor Wayne, to pray, yeah, well. to pray for those leaders who are listening in, to pray for those who support their leaders in, in various capacities, uh, for the spouses of leaders, and so if you'd just close our time in prayer, I'd appreciate that. Let's do that, and let's all bow our heads. Lord, we uh, pause here at this site and we do that at all of the other sites as well across the country and this nation. And we pause and we ask for a special grace to be on your people. Yes, Lord. That we have a deep love for the things of God, but we forget our humanity. We forget our frailty, our temporality. And Lord, we ask that you would empower us afresh by your Holy Spirit. I pray for the spouses of all of these that are serving you. Lord, that they will have a sense about them to be able to, to catch, to notice, and to identify when we're starting down a, a slide, the side of a hill, and to be able to grasp our hand and put our hand in yours. Lord, I pray for these supporters. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to see you as the one who does it all. And that we take our place with great privilege to be a part of that, not all of that. Mm -hmm. You be our all in all. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this candid conversation. May it be a holy moment on holy ground for many in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Lord.